What's going on, smart people? A couple weeks ago, I put out a poll that said, out of a few options, what do you want to see on the next drinking and deriving episode? And the generalized uncertainty principle one. So that's what we're going to be deriving today. I went through a lot of this video already, and I made a huge mistake at the beginning. So I'm sorry, but I, I'm already I got a head start. But you may have seen this equation in a couple different forms. At the end of the video, I'll show you how they're all equivalent. And to get started, the first thing that I want to point out is that a lot of people attribute the uncertainty relation to some weird consequence of quantum mechanics, which is true, it is, but physics kind of stole it from statistics in the first place. What a physicist calls uncertainty, a statistician would just call standard deviation. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to take a concept in statistics, quantum mechanicalize it, so we're going to take the statistics concept, translate it into quantum mechanics terminology, and then use that to derive the generalized uncertainty principle. The equation we're going to use for our jumping off point is the following. That the variance is equal to E x minus... I'm going to explain this, by the way, in case you were wondering. Okay, what this tells you is there's this thing called the variance, which is the square of the standard deviation, and it's equal to the expected value of some random variable minus the mean squared. Let's define our terms and then translate. Okay, variance, that's just sigma squared. That's the standard deviation squared. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna add a little subscript in a little bit because we're gonna end up dealing with operators and stuff, but you get the idea. E is gonna be probably really easy to translate into quantum because it's just the, ex uh, it's the expected value. So if we have some operator and we want to find the expectation value, well, that's just going to be if we have some operator O, we know that that's just with respect to some state that we're acting on, that's going to be the matrix element. Okay, great. Moving forward, X. So X here in a physics context is just going to be some measurement. It's going to be something that we get. Normally, if we want to simulate something, we would do like a random selection. We would be randomly selecting from a distribution. If you're actually doing an experiment, it would be the measurement itself. And the classical observables for quantum mechanics are replaced with quantum mechanical operators. So it makes sense that X being the measurement becomes some operator. We'll call that Oh, no, I was about to say the expectation value. It's just some operator that we'll call A. Then the mean is just the expectation value of this operator. So mu, which is the mean, becomes the expectation value of A. So if we just go ahead and substitute all of this stuff into this equation, what we get is that sigma squared we want to have it with respect to some operator, and we'll assume that there's some state that it's also with respect to. So sigma squared A, because we're dealing with this measurement, is equal to the expectation value E of X, which is an operator, minus the expectation value of the operator squared. Looking at this at first glance, it makes me feel a little weird because you have an operator minus a number, which doesn't really make sense. But you've got to, you can't look at it this way. You've got to look at it as this being an operator. This is effectively our operator O that is being sandwiched in between two states, psi. Okay, now we're ready to move on. Let's go ahead and write this up top. The past is in the past. What I want to do now is I want to treat this as an operator and I want to act on some state. So I want to take my A operator minus the expectation value, acting on some state, we'll call it N, and it's going to spit out another state. So it's going to spit out some new state that we'll call M. Next what I want to do is I want to take the inner product with M N itself. So I want to do M M is equal to, well, this n just becomes a bra, right? We, we Hermitian conjugate this n. And then if we assume that our operators correspond to observables, then by definition, these, uh, these operators have to be Hermitian because Hermitian operators are guaranteed to give us real eigenvalues, which are the measurements that we make. So this is just gonna become our n 
a oops minus a a minus a n this is m so this part is m and then complex conjugate or a hermitian conjugate both sides this is the complex conjugate so this is this part so if we take the inner product we get this but take a look at that we have our operator squared and then we're taking the expectation value of it so this is just sigma a squared now let's go ahead and do this for another operator that we'll call b and we're going to have b act on the exact same state but there's no reason to think that it spits out the same state m. So we're going to define some operator b such that the operator b minus the expectation value acting on our state n gives us some new state that we'll call l. Go through the exact same thing. L, l is equal to cool j. Just kidding. Um, God, that was a stupid joke. <laughs> b minus b. Uh, B minus B N. And this is just going to give us sigma B squared. Great. Moving on. The next thing that we need, this, uh, this whole uncertainty relation has that greater than equal to sign. It has an inequality. The way that we get this inequality is through the Schwartz inequality. you got to use the Schwartz. The kids love it. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. So the Schwartz inequality tells us that if we have some vectors and we take the inner product between them, it's going to, they're going to obey this type of inequality. And we're going to just, to make things painfully clear, we'll use these. We'll use these to make it super clear. So we'll say m, m times l, l is greater than or equal to the magnitude of m, l, squared. Um, there's a proof for this. It's kind of annoying to do, uh, and I don't want to do it strictly because I get bored doing that, and it's also kind of, kind of obvious. The inner product is just a generalization of the dot product, right? You generalize the dot product for discrete space, but then with continuous indices. So what this tells you, basically, let's, let's do a special case. If you guys want me to prove this in another video, I will. I just didn't want to have to prove everything that I end up using in this, that would just make this super, super long. But let's pretend we have some state m equal to, let's call it e sub x. So it's our basis vector. We're doing the uh, x basis vector. Let's let l equal, I don't know, 2 e sub x plus e sub y. And let's go ahead and calculate this and see if this holds. And, that, and, then, <laughs> and then I'm going to explain why it makes sense that it has to hold. So m, that's e sub x dot e sub x, that's just 1, l, l is just 4 um, plus 1, so that's 5, m, l is going to give us, well this is orthogonal to the e sub y, so that's not going to contribute, so it's just going to give us 2, and m, l squared is just going to give us 4. What this told us is that 5 is greater than or equal to 4. Makes sense. The way that I like to look at this is in terms of regular vectors and a dot product. If you have, and it makes it painfully clear if you make one of them a basis vector, or an orthonormal basis vector, a unit vector, sorry. Um, because if you have a dot product where one of them is a unit vector, then taking the dot product between two vectors just tells you how much in the same direction those two vectors are. So that's going to be a maximum if they are in the same direction, and it's going to be a minimum if they're not. So if we take the product of those two, so it's going to be extra maximum if they're the same vector. So we have the same vector dotted into itself times the same vector dotted into itself is greater than or equal to the dot product between maybe two different ones. If these are the same vector, then the left-hand side just equals the right-hand side, and of course it does. Now, pretend that these are maybe parts of an orthonormal basis vector. Well, then if these are orthogonal, then that goes to zero, and then everything in between. So it makes sense. I really didn't want to spend time deriving it because, you know, I, I, I don't think the derivation is kind of tedious, and I think it doesn't need to be, maybe it should be derived. Let me know if you want to see the derivation in another video. 
but I'm gonna say that this holds. The Schwartz inequalities is, is dope. What this tells us, and it's super helpful because we chose you know, the same terminology here, is that this is just the variance of A, this is just the variance of the operator B. So this just tells us that uh, sigma A squared sigma B squared is greater than or equal to whatever this is. So this is what we need to calculate, and we need to, hopefully, this ends up being the thing on the right-hand side here. Okay. This is just a complex number, right? In general, this could be a complex vector, a complex vector, their inner product could give you something that's complex. And so if we have some complex number, let's not do that, we can write it as, you know, some real number plus some imaginary number. And then we can also say that its complex conjugate is equal to x minus iy. Who drank my beer? There we go. Okay, so if we want to find the magnitude, the magnitude of z is just equal to z, z star, which is equal to x plus iy x minus iy, which is equal to x squared plus y squared, the cross terms cancel. And that's what we should get because the magnitude should be positive definite, could be zero also, but whatever. Okay, so in this case, the reason I'm doing this is because we have a complex number squared. The magnitude tells us that we're interested, eventually we're interested in ml, l, m where these are just complex numbers, and this is its uh, complex conjugate. It gets transposed as well. Let's go ahead and switch into polar coordinates, because uh, we have x squared plus y squared. We know that x is just equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta. And using Euler's identity, we also know that cosine theta is equal to e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2, and uh, I'll write it down here, uh, sine theta is equal to e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i. And what we want to do is we want to substitute this in. One thing that we've, we've implicitly assumed here is that we're dealing with a unit circle, which means r in this case is 1. It doesn't have to. We could use an arbitrarily large circle. It'll still work. But since we're dealing with this kind of identity, it would be nice to, um, to make these unit vectors. So let's, let's go ahead and assume that r is 1 here. Again, it doesn't have to. If it's not, then we just have r's attached to each of these. And nothing will change. And then we can substitute this, which is just our x now, into this equation. So this whole thing goes in there. And we get, where do I want to write this? I guess we'll do it right now. x squared plus y squared becomes e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2 squared x squared plus, sorry, I know I'm running out of room. This is just getting to the point to where I can actually work with this. Plus e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i squared. Well, z, that's just z, this is just z star, that's just z, and that's just z star. So, we can simplify this and write that the magnitude of z is equal to z plus z star over 2 squared plus z minus z star over 2i squared. This is something we can work with. So the magnitude of a complex number can be written in terms of the complex number and its complex conjugate. Now, if we make the substitution that z is equal to ml, so this is just a complex number, and z star is just equal to lm, what we get is that the magnitude of ml squared equal to uh, ml 
plus L M L M over two squared plus M L minus L M over two I squared. Believe it or not, writing it in that cumbersome notation is actually super helpful because we know what M is, we know what L is, and we can just make the substitution. This is M, this is L, and we can just evaluate these inner products. I'm going to make myself some room and erase all of this stuff. So, by the way, every time I erase something, you have to drink house rules. I'm gonna write this up now. Uh, magnitude of m l squared is equal to m l plus l m over two plus squared plus m l minus l m. Okay. How's my looking on time? We're doing good. Cool. Now let's calculate what these are. ML is equal to, this is our M, but we need to Hermitian conjugate it. So again, this cat becomes a bra. These don't really change. They just act to the left now. So that's N. Uh, a minus expectation value of A. So this is just yeah, mirror of that. And then we also need L, that's just this. Times B minus expectation value of B acting on N. Let's go ahead and foil everything out. Now this part, I'm gonna go through everything once we actually calculate LM, I'll go a little bit faster because this is another little tedious part. So this is equal to N A B. Let's see. So that is minus A B minus B A uh, plus A. Okay, the expectation value of the sum of these things is just the sum of the expectation value. So this is just equal to n a b. I'm going to drop the hats. I think you guys get the idea that these are operators by now. Minus n a b. I say I'm going to drop whatever. Screw you guys. I do what I want. And then this minus n B, A, um, I'm going to need plus N, A, B, N. So I just split this up. This is the definition. Do I have that anywhere? This is just the expectation value of A, B, right? This is just some new operator we're taking the expectation value of. So this is equal to a, B. This, well, B is just a number, right? This is just the expectation value of B should be a number. So this just can be pulled out of the product. So this is minus B, N, A, N, or Nan. This is also just a number. This A is just a number. This is minus A, uh, N, B, N. And then these both are just numbers, so plus in the beginning I said let's assume that these are normalized, so this is just one. And this whole thing simplifies to A B. This is just the expectation value of A, so it's minus B A. This is just the expectation value of B. 
So that's minus, again, BA. These are just numbers. And then we've got plus AP. Finally, we get that this is equal to AB minus B times A. Oh, okay, we're almost there. Jesus, I forgot how much algebra this was. I'm only deriving drug because this derivation drove me to drink. So let's erase this and plop that right up now. Shit. Well, this is equal to BA minus AB. Fantastic. Cool. So let's go ahead and substitute these things into here. Don't worry. When I was deriving this, I was like, am I really going to have to foil this out right now? I don't want to do that. You don't have to do that. It, it comes out pretty nice. So substituting this LM and this ML into this equation, we get that M, nope. I'm going to give myself a little bit more space. I'm going to say magnitude ML squared is, is equal to, so we've got ML, which is this, so AB minus A times B plus LM, which is this right now, plus BA minus AB. It really is just not helpful for me to say AB when they're not exactly an expectation value of these, I mean, over 2 squared plus uh, la, 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 this term, ML, which is AB, minus, all right, finish your beer, oh god, It would have been so much easier if it was like Bud Light or something. Actually, maybe not because that tastes like water butt. Okay, uh, minus M, minus LM, which is this, minus BA, minus minus AB, so plus AB over 2I squared. Next, we're pretty much on the last step here, plus a couple more steps. It's important to note that if we want to do, say, AB minus BA, that is the same thing as the expectation value of the commutator of A and B. Right, sandwich this in between a state, you get the exact same thing. Uh, you might not be as familiar with something called the anti-commutator. If we say we have A, B, say that like it was different, it's the same thing, plus B, A, that is equal to the expectation value of the anti-commutator, which is a little curly bracket, A, B. Not to be confused with the Poisson bracket, which looks exactly the same, so I understand if it's confusing. Okay, substituting these little boys, little boys, that was weird, into this, we got an AB plus a BA. That is exactly this expectation value of the anti-commutator. And we've got an AB minus a BA, which is just the regular commutator. So, uh, let's go ahead and erase this guy right here. M L magnitude squared is equal to expectation value of the anti-commutator of A and B. We got a minus AB and a minus AB, so that's a minus 2 expectation value of A B over 2 squared. Get rid of this little guy because we just wrote it down, 
plus, well, these ones cancel because we've got a minus and a plus, and then we've just got the commutator. So plus the expectation value of the commutator of A and B over 2i squared. Get rid of that guy now. Okay. It looks like we're not that close yet because this looks, well, I mean, this looks, this is that. But what about this term? This term is strictly positive, right? We've got the anti-commutator of this and this, and then we're squaring it. This is going to give us a positive number. Okay, so if we were to say something like 10 is greater than or equal to 5, I don't know, minus 1 or something, if we got rid of the positive term, so this is equal to uh, 4. I don't know why I think so hard. If we got rid of the positive number, then we get 10 is greater than or equal to minus 1. So getting rid of the positive number gives us something that sure as hell satisfies this inequality, even more so, I guess you could say. So if we get rid of this commutator, the inequality that we're trying to prove is only strengthened, that it's given by the Schwartz inequality. So we get that sigma squared a sigma squared b is greater than or equal to, if we get rid of this term, the inequality is strengthened, this. Nope. Okay. You might have seen this, so this, we're done. We got it, we got the answer. But you might have seen this in a slightly different form. Um, there's a few things that I wanna point out here. We have the commutator of what we are assuming is two Hermitian operators. The expectation value of the commutator of two Hermitian operators is guaranteed to give you an imaginary number or something that's imaginary. Um, maybe it can also give you zero, but you know, zero it can arguably be considered a complex number. Um, this is complex and we've got an i and so those i's effectively cancel is what I'm getting at. Sometimes what you will see is that sigma squared a, sigma squared b is greater than or equal to, if, if you factor out, so here you can factor out the 1 over 2i by squaring it, so you get a minus 1 fourth, uh, the expectation value of a and b squared. Let's forget about what I was about to say for a second. You get this. You get the uncertainty, it looks like it possibly could be negative, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, so the only way for it to make sense is if you can argue that this quantity here is always going to also be negative. And that's why I said the commutator between A and B is going to give you that something that is anti-Hermitian, assuming A and B are Hermitian. So the expectation value will be purely imaginary. So the imaginary quantity squared is going to give you a negative number. So the negative number times the minus one-fourth makes everything okay. So since it doesn't matter, since there's always, it's guaranteed that there's gonna be a complex number that cancels with the i, you'll see sometimes people write that sigma a squared sigma b squared is greater than or equal to the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator of A and B squared times one-fourth. Okay, so that's it. That's the generalized uncertainty principle. Most people are familiar with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says that places like an upper bound on, well, on how well you can measure something's position and momentum. So if we've generalized that to apply to any kind of operator, I say any, I'm sure there's exceptions. Uh, but we've generalized it. It should at least be able to reduce to that if we use position and momentum for A and B. So let's see if it does. What? So if we use our operator's position and momentum, 
do we recover the coveted Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Let's find out. Okay. So what we just posited, not what we posited, what we just derived is that sigma a squared, sigma b squared, uh, so we've got a comma b over 2i squared, or you can write it as sigma a Let's go ahead and do this for position and momentum. So in this case, a, let's call that r, let's work in the in the coordinate representation. So a is equal to x hat and p, nope, b, well, <laughs> happy little accident, is equal to p hat. We need to calculate this commutator. Well, <laughs> I'm assuming you're all familiar with the canonical commutation relation for position and momentum that says that x commuted with p is equal to, s no, sorry, i h bar. Let's go ahead and substitute this in. So we get that, um, let's call that delta x squared delta uh, p squared. This is also the same notation for the sigmas that you might see. The uncertainty in x squared, uncertainty in p squared, is greater than or equal to, if we do it here, this is why I say I kind of prefer this, because you can see the i's cancel, is you get the expectation value of a commuted with b, which is going to give me an i h bar, okay, over 2i squared. We square that, we get, well, the i's cancel, and we get an h bar squared over 4. In other words, delta x delta p is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. And in this way, you don't have to calculate magnitudes or whatever. You can just plug it straight in and see the i's cancel for yourself. So there we have, we've, we've derived the generalized uncertainty principle we've reduced it to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and I've done this video like two times already I'm sorry I'm, I'm kind of got a little buzz going but awesome guys we just derived it I'm stoked it might have sounded like I was getting frustrated at points and I definitely would have if I wasn't if I wasn't sipping a little something something but I have a good time doing these kind of drinking and deriving episodes because there's some tedious ass de 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 derivations that I would hate to do if I was sober uh, and this just makes it more fun. It, it does. I, I mean, you don't have to drink to have fun, but um, I don't know where, where I'm going with that. See you tomorrow.